Welcome everyone to the first SAMI Summer Series of the year. I'm Maggie Moore, a Senior Manager at the Partnership for Public Service, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's conversation. The Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medals, or the SAMIs, honor exceptional public servants whose efforts have made a tremendous impact on our lives. We created this award more than 20 years ago to build trust in our government and to inspire more people to consider careers in public service. With this virtual event series, we aim to shine a spotlight on this year's fantastic finalists and their hard work and dedication. Our 27 finalists this year, both individuals and teams, represent the breadth of important work being done across the government to make our lives better. Throughout the summer, we'll hear how government leads in innovation, engages around the world, demands transparency and accountability both from itself and from others. And if you're interested in join, uh, joining future events for this very series, please go to pu ourpublicservice.org slash events to learn more. Today, though, we're going to focus our discussion on the many important ways our government delivers services to the public. The conversation will be moderated by my colleague Jordan LaPierre, and our panel includes Richard McKeon, a senior advisor from SAMHSA, Gloria Shepard from the Department of Transportation, and Rocky Foyer from the National Cancer Institute. Welcome to the panel, and over to you, Jordan. Thanks so much, Maggie. And again, I'll just echo Maggie's thanks to everybody who's joining us for today's conversation. It is truly one of the highlights of the year for me personally, and for us at the partnership to be able to share these incredible stories with you and shine a spotlight on these incredible public servants. Um, so I wanna start by posing one question for each of the, our panelists today to answer. Um, you've all had long and successful careers in public service. Why did you choose public service? Um, Gloria, I'd love to hear from you first on this. Um, I think early on in people's lives, they understand whether they're uh, public oriented or profit oriented. And I'm definitely not a person who's profit oriented. I was brought up culturally um, by my parents who were in the church and made sure I was there um, a significant amount of time. And during those times, I watched and helped them as they provided a ride for people who needed rides to various locations, who uh, helped people who were sick and did not have um, nursing care that they needed, um, provided food, uh, cooked food, made sure that their church, the church was uh, well-funded by their service. And one of those things, those things become part of you, um, serving service to people and making sure that you help people um, who are not as well off um, as you are. I, not to say that I was well off, but my, whatever we had, we were taught to give. And that follows sends me into my uh, public career, uh, working with people, working for people, working for the citizens of the U.S. Um, to make uh, transportation, the part that we play in transportation, better for them. Um, to understand that when people don't have necessarily automobiles and, and the other kinds of uh, vehicles to take them to different locations. So to ensure that um, the, the state and our partners look at making um, provisions for people who uh, are not as well off as other people. So I think service is just something I was brought up with. It, I carried over to my adult life and carried over into the the choice of my employment, public service. Richard, how about you? Well, I think that uh, for me, the uh, first uh, part of my career, the first half of my career was as a clinical psychologist working in a hospital-based uh, community mental health system in New Jersey. Um, in, and it included running a psychiatric emergency service. And one of the things that was really very clear um, was the powerful impact that public policy had on people's lives. You know, the emergency room is a place where uh, you see all kind of different kinds of situations and the impact that various kinds of public policies have on people. So it was really that that led me to transition uh, mid-career um, and I did that by becoming a um, American Psychological Association Congressional Fellow 
where I worked in the office of U.S. Senator Paul Wellstone. Um, and then from there went to SAMHSA so I could continue to work on the public policy issues that felt was so important. Thanks, Richard. And Rocky, over to you. and graduate school at the National Institutes of Education, which is uh, part of the Department of Education's now defunct, uh, and one between my third and fourth years of graduate school at the National Institutes of Mental Health, and I actually got my PhD thesis data from there. And from those experiences, I just felt a real calling for government service, both the broad impact of the work and the altruistic goal of advancing the interest of the American public. And then when I finished graduate school, I don't want to date myself, but it was during the Reagan administration, and there was a reduction in force, so it was really difficult to get a federal job. So I went to work at Mount Sinai School of Medicine as a statistician for the Cancer Center. I was analyzing data from trials, treatment trials and lab experiments. But after several years, I got a really wonderful opportunity to join government uh, at the National Cancer Institute in its Population Sciences Division. And I really learned much more about the tremendous opportunities. I've been doing treatment studies, but the tremendous opportunities inherent in cancer prevention and cancer screening, and along with the challenges and their opportunities. So there's just been so many wonderful opportunities in doing that. Rocky, I'd love to stay with you. Would you say that you've made a greater impact in government than you might have otherwise? And so kind of how do you quantify or think about you know, what that difference might have been? Yeah, so definitely. In federal government, I think your work by definition has a national and sometimes really international scope. So I initiated and led a consortium, lead a consortium of, of simulation modelers. It's called the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network, or CISNET. And for the last, let's let for the last 22 years, that really helped fundamentally change how U.S. screening uh, recommendations are developed. And I see it sort of like leading an orchestra instead of playing an instrument. And I was thinking back when I thought about this, this type of question, if I'd gotten a peek when I first joined the National Cancer Institute 36 years ago of what I was able to accomplish by virtue of given, being given so many wonderful opportunities, I think I never would have believed it. I probably would have fainted or something like that because it's just, uh, yeah, sort of beyond, as I look back over my career, beyond my belief. Yeah. Gloria, what would you say? I would say, yes, um, I have made an uh, impact in government and um, that, that more so than I would if I was not in government because um, government is not only, in each transportation, is not only about the, the facilities we build, the capital construction, not, whether it's in rail or transit or highways and uh, up to the other modes also, but it's also about people and how we can use our professions and our different modes to impact people. Um, I think fundamentally we have to remember that government is about social people. And so I hope I've uh, instilled that in the work ethic of the people I work here um, at the Federal Highway Administration. I know that um, it's uh, also about bringing people along. And I've been blessed with uh, several opportunities that have led me to this position as executive director. In this capacity, I try to make sure that we have the appropriate number, not only number, but quality um, training to bring people along so they can, we can do promote succession planning. Um, there's an aging in the workforce in Federal Highway, a good deal of our senior executives and our team leaders are eligible for, for retirement. So the question is, what bench do we have? Who can take our places when we leave? How can we make sure it's stable, that our agency is stable and can move forward and advance even further than we have? So if I can succeed in building a, a, a steady and, and qualified bench, and also an excited bench, I think that I will have uh, served, um, served my uh, agency well. That's great. Richard, let me close this one out. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, um, I've been privileged to work on a number of major initiatives, and I don't think I could have anticipated when I started federal service. Um, but one of those uh, was starting back in uh, 2000, 
uh, and five, uh, our Garrett Lee Smith Youth Suicide Prevention Grant Program, um, which is a program where our evaluation studies have shown that counties implementing grant-related activities have lower youth suicide rates than match counties who did not. Uh, also, the development of what's called our Zero Suicide Initiative, which has been working successfully to strengthen suicide prevention efforts within healthcare systems. And then finally, um, I don't think that I could have imagined not only that there would be a three-digit number for suicide prevention, 988, uh, but also the extent to which people across the country, public officials in the state and local level uh, providers, et cetera, would, um, would buy into the notion that a three-digit number could be a catalyst for change in behavioral health crisis services across the country. I, I don't think I ever could have imagined all of that when I started. So thanks for that, Richard. And I want to stick with you. We'll bring Gloria and Rocky back into the conversation in just a little bit. But I'd love to dig deeper with you, Richard, on what you and your colleagues have been able to accomplish. Um, you and your colleagues at SAMHSA were recognized for your work to set up that new 988 number for the National Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Support Hotline. And as you suggested, that took years of planning. What wasn't working with the prior 10-digit system that prompted the desire for this change? Well, it wasn't that it wasn't working because there were, you know, th there were many people who were calling. Uh, but the concern was that um, in the middle of a crisis, and we actually said precisely this in our report to the Federal Communications Commission when we were asked to do a, a study and analysis about whether a three-digit number would be helpful and whether it be feasible. One of the points that we made uh, was that if somebody's having significant chest pain, um, it's likely that, uh, and they were with a family member, it's likely that both the person and the family member would remember the number 911. The concern was that in a suicidal crisis, it would be quite possible that neither the person nor the family member would remember the previous 10 digit number. And um, so we felt that more people who were in acute suicidal crisis would be able to access needed services any time of the day or night from anywhere um, in the country. We also felt that a three digit number um, might have the ability to help catalyze the development of behavioral health crisis services in much the same way that over a half a century, 911 became a catalyst for the development of emergency medical services. That's an incredible perspective, but I gather from talking with you and reading uh, the nomination and a little bit more about your work, that it wasn't as simple as saying, all right, now here's a 988 number. There were a lot of hurdles and barriers that had to be overcome to making this happen. Can you talk through some of what those challenges were? Sure. It was so it had to be a multi a multi-agency effort um, because the operational side had to be overseen by the Federal Communications Commission. So this was really an effort between SAMHSA, the Veterans Administration, and the Federal Communications Commission. And the three agencies were asked to first study this and to report to Congress on it. Uh, and, and then it was put into law. But to give you an idea, um, what had to happen was that the number 988 had to be made operational on every landline, every cell phone, every voiceover internet device in the, in the country. And so the FCC had to oversee that with all of the uh, uh, tech and communications providers, uh, which was pretty complicated, not so much for the cell phones, but particularly for the landlines. And then text to 988 also needed to be uh, enabled. And 
a number had to be identified that wasn't being used currently as an area code uh, because if it was used as an area code, all those calls would be going to the wrong place. So, um, and then uh, for SAMSEN, for the Veterans Administration, our task was to make sure that the capacity to answer the calls, the chats, and the texts would be in place, which um, required a significant increase in resources for a previously under-resourced uh, system. Uh, but we now have over 200 crisis centers who are answering the calls, the chats, and the texts, and the numbers are up, and the speed of answer is also up, which is really important because if somebody is um, in a suicidal crisis, having to wait two, three, four, five minutes um, uh, can, can be a lifetime. Yeah, uh Absolutely. And you've sort of identified the other thing that struck me about your accomplishment, the idea that there were two streams to this work, both the technology and the people. And you broached this topic a little bit, but I'd love to dig deeper on how you and your team addressed the people side of the equation to ensure that, as you said, if more calls came in, the system would be ready to handle them. Where are these folks coming from who are picking up the phones? How did you recruit them? How are you ensuring uh, that the system is as staffed as it needs to be? Yeah, so the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline started in 2004. So we were building on the foundation of the already existing uh, crisis call centers who had been answering those calls. So fortunately, we weren't starting from scratch. Uh, we were starting, on, we, we were building on the shoulders of an incredible group of organizations and people, um, some staffed in by, entirely by mental health professionals, others uh, staffed uh, primarily by well-trained volunteers being supervised by mental health professionals. So that even if it's two o'clock in the morning that a call can be answered or on a holiday, um, you know, et cetera. Um, but in order to build that capacity, I said had previously been under resourced, it took significant um, additional resources. You know, the first appropriation for the this uh, hotline was $3 million. As recently as I think it was four years ago, it was at $24 million. You know, now it's at over 500 million. So that additional funding allowed us to direct that to this incredible network of crisis centers uh, so they could hire more people. Uh, the other thing that, that did help was the move to remote work that many of us experienced in our federal agencies and our, but also in the crisis call centers because it allowed these centers to recruit um, from all across their states or even across the country in some instances. So that allowed us to expand the potential pool since a, a crisis center um, in Boston, for example, would not have to uh, be limited to people who were in driving distance you know, of the call center. Thank you so much and congratulations to you and your team for your accomplishment. We'll come back to you at the end of the conversation. Gloria, I'd love to turn to you now. You and your colleagues across the Department of Transportation um, are responsible for coordinating the implementation of the historic investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law. I'd love to start by just getting an understanding of what is the size of the unmet need in infrastructure investment across the country today? Well, it's hard to quantify the size of the unmet need. I can tell you that the bipartisan infrastructure law provided uh, a significant historic amount of dollars to transportation and especially to highway transportation, over $300 billion probably uh, a year, um, trillion dollars at this higher uh, realization period. Um, and that's only in highways. I mean, you have transit that has needs and you have uh, the rail that has needs also. Um, but from the highway perspective, the, um, the dollars uh, uh, are going to mostly 90% uh, to the state, but there are provisions that allow for 
dollars that go off through discretionary grants to local people and uh, other um, partners that we have not had a lot of uh, interaction with historically. Um, like, and for example, it can go to county, it can go to um, nonprofits, it can go to tribes. We do have a lot of interest, interaction with the federal government. But the, but the, um, the, the real objective was is to get the money in the hands of the locals because they understand their needs. Um, they understand, um, they, they want to understand better how to administer the money so they can address those needs. Um, and the historic amount of dollars for transfers for highways means that um, different parts of the country can take care of their unmet needs. Um, in the Northeast, which is a, a, an old, a older infrastructure, there might be a lot of system preservation. In places that are growing throughout the country, in the South and the West, there may need for new capacity. So we rely on the states um, to um, to define uh, what their needs are and to prepare uh, their programs, infrastructure programs, to address those needs. And the good thing about the bipartisan infrastructure law is that it doesn't focus on construction of facilities only. We think about transportation, we think about bridges and highways and pavement and steel. Um, there's a part of it that uh, focuses on people specifically. I'll give you an example. Re reconnecting community program. The program is about addressing some of the um, transportation that was built historically that separated communities, um, divided them in half, um, went through their 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 um, their uh, social their social networks basically, and divided them. It could have been divided by divided churches, it could divided uh, people in neighborhoods, um, but it's really just separated communities. So what uh, reconnecting communities uh, started to do was to give money um, to discretionary grant to people, um, locals um, and states, but mostly locals, to come up with ideas, do plan, and be able to recon uh, reconnect their communities. They also help the state um, in helping them to fund programs to reconnecting communities. Um, so an example is an I-70 um, Colorado. Um, the state build a new facility, and, but they build a cap over it. A cap is, uh, I don't know if you know it, but it's kind of like uh, over, but it's a tunnel underneath, so it has to be saved and have the proper ventilation and those things. But what it allowed it to do is connect to historically divided communities. Um, that project had over $200 million in mitigation because they want to not only complete the uh, facility itself, but they want to make sure that the neighborhood that was historically impacted was made better by that facility. So along with that, um, with that project came building of recreational centers, schools, um, other types of um, mitigation efforts that could address people needs rather than just uh, highway transportation in the traditional sense. So that's a major uh, program in uh, federal high, and not only, I'm sorry, in the Office of Secretary who administers it with um, federal highway, but they lead the effort um, to focus on people and making transportation work for people. Um, because all too often, um, some of our projects, um, they don't provide the access they need um, and what we call ladders of opportunity because Transportation is also about making sure that people can get, uh, underserved people can get to essential locations like economic centers, like uh, health centers, like good food uh, areas rather than living in uh, agricultural deserts. Um, so, a food desert. So, the um, parts of transportation that looks at working with the states to identify the gaps in their transportation to close those gaps so people who are underserved can be better served because they have a means to get to places of essential services. I think that's such a fascinating perspective and I really appreciate you sharing it, this idea of infrastructure being an agent for social change and community change and community revitalization in a lot of different dimensions. Um, I'd love to know what some of the challenges you and your team are facing in term, are in terms of 
um, identifying which projects are ready to receive funds and in delivering those funds to the right agencies and the right entities. How does that system work? Well, for the most part, I remember that 90% of the foreign bond uh, bill and other um, previous reauthorization, 80% of the reauthorization, 90% of this goes directly to the states. And the states um, have the systems and the capacity and the program to, that are set up um, to show where to demonstrate which projects are ready. For example, the Metropolitan Planning Organization in the states. Um, develop what's called a transportation improvement program. And when the states add their projects to the in the Metropolitan Planning Organization program, it becomes a statewide transportation program. Those projects are put there because they're ready to go. They have the money associated with them, what we call the clip and strain and ready, and ready to go. So we can look to those, um, what we call SIP, um, to see what the states have programmed and what they are, are forecasting when, when they develop a metropolitan lowering plan for uh, no less than 20 years. The step itself is four years. With the locals, it's a bit different because um, they need more attention in developing their projects and plans. Um, and even after they develop them, they need to work, they need to make sure that they work with the state. Um, and the metropolitan organizations to get those projects programmed. So what we do, what we've been doing through uh, uh, reconnecting communities efforts and driving communities efforts is to provide technical assistance to a lot of local who have historically not worked with us and don't understand the planning process or um, the construction, how to do construction, or even how to do a feasibility study. So these programs in the department works to are addressed specifically, focused specifically on local governments. And that, when I say local, I mean counties. I mean uh, basically pretty much anything that's not that's outside of the states. So you talk about rural areas. You talk about, like I said, nonprofits and uh, federally recognized spots. So working with people who have historically not had the experience that the states have and do not have the systems that the states have um, to go in and provide them with technical assistance to make their projects ready so they can be, in certain cases, constructed. So plans can be developed that can turn into construction uh, of programs. So the Office of the Secretary is uh, um, leading uh, those two programs and working with the MOES because the MOES are the implementers. Uh, we, uh, but we are working with them closely to ensure that um, that we're focusing on a population that really needs our attention. And then lastly, once the money is out the door, how are you and your colleagues tracking how the dollars are spent? I know this was a big question around the American Recovery uh, Act back in uh, the early teens. Right. Uh, how was how are you addressing that this time around? Yeah, it's ironic that you mentioned ARA because I led that for Federal Highway um, yeah. during that time. That's one of the great opportunities that I, I had to uh, show some uh, leadership and deliver on um, products. Um, basically, the uh, modes have financial management information systems. We call our STEMIS, financial management information systems. Each mode has its own financial system. Um, and those systems track the uh, progress of the project. So different phases and go in uh, and track the famous and we are reimbursable. So when they do certain work, you know, we code it and we, can, we provide them with the dollars uh, for the work that they've uh, conducted. Um, the department has a, a, a financial management system. It's called Delphi. So it has all of the modes. Uh, information, financial information in that system. It's not to the level of detail on the mode, in the mode, but it is the it is the uh, department's uh, record, basically uh, financial record um, of how the modes are um, performing and spending their money. So on our level, the state will input data into the um, to FEMA's and. When it comes to the locals and the discretionary grants, we will work with the locals and our division offices will put, put, make sure that information 
was input, just input into the financial mechanism. system. We have 52 divisions. We have divisions in every state, including Puerto Rico and DC. So all the projects that are carried out in those different areas, whether they're by um, the states or um, non-state entities, that information is entered into those systems and that's how we track the funds um, throughout the, for all the transportation projects. I well, Gloria, thanks for sharing this perspective. I think you've really shifted my understanding of the purpose behind and the goals behind uh, these investments. Um, and congratulations to you and your colleagues. We'll come back to you at the end of the conversation. I'd love to bring in Rocky Fuhrer now. Um, Rocky, you have helped to transform our understanding of cancer risks on a population level, um, uncovering the prevalence of some more common cancers I'd love to just start by knowing why is it important to know how many people within a given population will get a certain type of cancer? Why do we need this level of study? Yeah, so rising cancer risks at the population level are kind of a signal that public health officials and researchers need to look for the underlying reason and what sort of interventions can be implemented to slow or stop this rise. So to make it concrete, I want to talk about one example, if I may and that's uh, liver cancer. Liver cancer rates were heading up dramatically between 1975 and 2014, between three and 4% a year. That's quite a bit. If you know compound interest, when you put money in the bank, three and 4% a year, doesn't seem like much, but it, it, it was a huge rise over all these years. And closer examination indicated that much of that rise was driven by the baby boomers. Those are the people born after World War II from 1945 to 1965. And hepatitis C is a major risk factor for liver cancer. And it was estimated about three quarters of those living with hepatitis C were baby boomers. And a lot of, much of it is undiagnosed because you can have hepatitis C for many years without symptoms. And this rise was associated with those who had blood transfusions prior to 1992 when they did some things to clean up the blood supply or injection drug use or intranasal drug use. And sometimes that drug use could have occurred decades ago. There's no vaccine for hepatitis uh, C, but screening and treatment for hepatitis C are very effective. So in 2013, the US Preventative Services Task Force recommended a one-time hepatitis C screening test for all, all us baby boomers and, um, and in two, and then amazingly, in 2015, liver cancer rates flattened out or even started to decline. And this was at least partly due to this policy change, but also because younger birth cohorts, people born after 1965 had longer, lower risks. And then the antiviral treatment that I mentioned, the treatment for hepatitis C, which was very effective, started in 2011 and people started taking it. So the story kind of goes full circle from examining population trends to understanding them, and finally to influencing them for the betterment of the health of the American public. So there's a, a real kind of circle of evidence, and uh, it shows why population trends are so important. I'd love to pull on that thread a little bit more and understand how some of the other ways that you and others are using the data you collect and track to create policy change and help ensure that Americans get access to other kinds of cancer screenings. And you know, we recently saw this news about the advice that women should start getting mammograms earlier. And I, there are changes all the time around kind of how we are working to do preventative screenings. I wonder if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah. So our the Simulation Modeling Consortium, CISNET, that I mentioned has worked in support of the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force that's run by ARC, but it's an outside group of, of people who they choose. And they develop new screening recommendations. And we help support the task force Actually, as you mentioned, in a recent draft recommendation to start breast cancer screening at age 40 instead of 50. And then just a few years ago, colorectal starts colorectal screening at age 45 instead of 50. And if something receives what's called an A or a B recommendation by the task force, that means strongly recommended or recommended, private insurers are mandated under provisions of the Affordable Care Act to include coverage with no copay or deductibles. And there's pretty good evidence that providing coverage, especially with no co-pays, dramatically improves access to screening. So it goes all the way from simulation modeling to work with the task force to uh, coverage by the Affordable Care Act. 
and then at, really opens up access to screening. One of the things that stood out in the nomination that was submitted to us about your work was the way in which um, groups outside of government have used it to power their own advocacy, advocacy campaigns to try to enact change. What has that been like to see your work being used in the hands of others to advocate for change, to push for change, to push for greater uh, screenings for breast cancer, for colon cancer? Um, it must be remarkable. Yeah, so let me tell a story from early in my career. So early in my career, I realized that many of the cancer statistics we, we, we put out are very difficult to understand. Uh, uh, that can cancer incidence rates, for example, is a rather abstract quantity that's difficult for most people. So for example, we say in our lingo, breast cancer rates are 125 per 100,000 population age adjusted to the 2000 US standard. Well, I could talk all day to my colleagues about that and they could shake their head, but I'd say that to the, to the general public and what are you talking about? So I felt this could be translated into something much more understandable. And that's the probability of being diagnosed with any specific cancer between any two ages, 50 to 60, or even a whole lifetime. So I revised some uh, older methodology for this, and we started releasing these sort of numbers annually for many different cancer sites by race and ethnicity, and even uh, starting to do things with smoking status. And one number we highlighted was that one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. You might've heard this number. Well, some months after this, and we put out this number, I was, as many people, I was half asleep on my couch watching the 11 o'clock news when a view of the US Capitol filled the screen with women holding placards advocating for more funding for breast cancer research, and they were yelling, hell no, we won't wait. The rate is now one in eight. And I was kind of jarred from my slumber and about fell off the couch. And really, this number was much easier to understand, and it surprised many people how many lives were impacted by breast cancer and really moved them to advocacy. And it really set a path for the rest of my career to look for ways to develop metrics and methods that would help support evidence-based advocacy and policy to serve the needs of the US population and other populations. So lastly, Rocky, I'd love to ask you, where do we go from here? What do you see as the gaps? What do we need to know that we don't know yet? Where's your research and those of your colleagues in this space going next? What can we look for? Yeah, so in a very broad sense, I'm interested in helping to inform what we sometimes call the formidable and growing gap, gap between the rapid pace and innovation in cancer research that's new treatments, screening tests, prevention strategies. They come at us faster and faster and faster, but we have to have an ability to efficiently harness them to improve population health. Just because something comes out doesn't mean we know how to really implement it in the population. So I'll give an example, and that's something kind of new. It's multiple cancer early detection tests or a promising new technology that can potentially screen for many different cancers from a single blood sample, pretty amazing. But however, many, there are many, a lot of important questions that need to be answered about how these tests should be implemented in the population and the cascade of follow-up tests, depending on the result we get. If we get it, suppose we get a positive test result, but we can't find cancer in the most likely site that the test indicates, what do we do next? Do we look further for this cancer using maybe more and more invasive procedures or start searching in other places? Should these tests be used in combination with the standard test, mammography and colonoscopy, or as a substitute? In what age ranges should we use these tests and how often? Well, we really never could do enough studies to determine all these answers, but we can synthesize all the available studies and then use the kind of modeling that, that, in the, that uh, is in part of the consortium to provide really a link between the complex evidence and to model many different public health strategies to, to study the potential benefits and harm. So as these new technologies come out, we need to work very hard on thinking about their population implementation um, so to really optimize their benefit for the American public. All right, we'll leave it there, Rocky. Congratulations Thank you. to you as well on being uh, selected as a finalist. I'd like to very briefly close our conversation before we leave today um, by bringing all three of you back into it. Um, one of our core missions at the partnership is to inspire a new generation to enter public service and become leaders in public service like you have. 
So I'm curious what your message would be to them looking back across your careers as to why they should make that choice now. Richard, let's start with you and then we'll go right on down the line um, very quickly um, as to your, what you want to say to young people today. Yeah, I think that um, what I would say is that one thing that my career demonstrates is that, as well as the other finalists, is that it is possible to have a significant impact for the public good um, by being engaged in public service. Um, so for me, working at, at uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, working in suicide prevention, um, I know that I've been able to participate in numerous efforts that have been able to save lives. And so I think that it is, um, you know, I'm reminded of the words in the Humphrey building as you go in um, fr from former Vice President Hubert Humphrey about the moral test of government um, is caring for those in need. I won't do the entire quote. Um, well, I, I think that there is an opportunity to pass that moral test on behalf of the American people when you are part, when you become a part of public service, working for the federal government or on the state and local level. Richard, thanks so much. Gloria. Um, I think I would tell younger people the same thing. I think that it's really good for Richard to say it. it's a possibility that it's possible to use uh, government service to make a change in our society. And for people who are attracted to transportation and highway or rail or transit, I would tell them that you know transportation is more than about constructing facilities and you know moving cars and freight. It's about people, um, and that you can uh, you can play a part in making people better, people's lives better by using transportation in those different perspectives. I would also tell them that as a minority. Um, you have the chance and opportunity too to advance to the highest level of government. I'm the highest level career person in federal government. Um, I'm the first African American woman and the first woman to be in this position. So I'm very grateful to have this position. But I also know that if you work hard and you chase performance and not success, success will come. And that you should not be discouraged by what you think may be a discriminatory system, because there are ways that there it's not. Hopefully, it's not discriminatory. But if it is, you can make you can make an impact and make it more fair. I would tell them not to uh, not to let setbacks um, put them out the game, but stay in the game, come in the game, and stay in the game, because you are the next. Gloria Shepherd, um, the I am the first, but I'm not the last. I'm here to open the door. I'm here to pull down the ladder and not lift it up, but keep pulling it down so people can continue. That's what I would tell you. I love that message. Thank you for sharing. Rocky, we'll give you the last word. Yeah. So I want to kind of echo what Richard and, and Gloria said. Statistical work is sometimes, you know, very technical and detailed. And there's kind of a joke about statisticians. You don't want to run into a statistician in a cocktail party because maybe, you know, maybe we'll hear all their technical and detailed things, but uh, work that they're doing. But working in the government has just provided, it's a wonderful opportunity to have impact and, and real impact on the American and for the American public. And then there's also a sort of along with that, is the altruism of the work. And you have to think every day uh, when you're doing things, you know, what would the American public want, you know, want from me in this, if you have a decision to make. And sometimes you have to think through the lens of your expertise, certainly, but, uh, um, but uh, uh, thinking about that just brings a, a, a real fulfillment to the work and that you probably don't get almost any other a place you might work. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you all for joining this conversation. And once again, congratulations to each of you and for Richard and Gloria, to the other members of your teams for being on um, being named finalists for this year's Service to America medals. So glad you could be here to share a little bit more about your work.
And finally, thanks to our audience for tuning in. Two quick housekeeping reminders before we go. First, as Maggie said at the top, this is just the first in a series of conversations with some of our Sammy's finalists over the course of this summer. And we hope you'll join us for the rest of that series. And again, you can find more information at ourpublicservice.org slash events. And finally, most importantly, voting for People's Choice is open. This is your chance to weigh in on the people and stories that resonate most with you. You can vote once every 24 hours at service to americamedals.org. Just click on People's Choice in the top right corner of the page. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.